okay hi welcome um wow what lovely faces gorgeous well some of them i can see there are there some beautiful faces and old and new to college um i just want to say a huge welcome and um to the great hall and also to dartington a great center of learning um i'm lou rainbow i'm the manager of the art and craft short course program here and today we are super excited to be celebrating the 30th birthday of Schumacher College. And we're also pleased to have its founder here, Shkumar. Yay! And also to celebrate this rather special publication um, called Transformative Learning, Reflections of 30 Years. And it's beautiful and it's, it is really change making to read it. Um, so if you do get a chance, save it with pennies or ask you to buy it for your birthday, etc. And get a signed copy today. Um, and it's really amazing. This week, right, um, we're delighted to say that right now we have 45 MA students on campus who live here. And this week we've had our first short course in 14 months. And we had a closing circle and there were lots of tears. So tick, tick, tick. Um, and the course was on politics, printmaking and night canoeing. Yeah. Yeah, that's the way to do it. So first of all, I'd really like to welcome some friends here. Um, who are gonna say some beautiful things, hopefully. Um, welcome, first of all, to Greg Carston, who is the chair of Prestige. He's going to say a few words about progressive learning. Thank you, Lou. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, this is not just a book launch, of course. It is mo most important celebration of progressive learning at Schumacher College for 30 years. But progressive learning has been an inspiration at Dartington Trust for a long time. Um, in 2025, we'll be celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Trust when Dorothy and Leonard Elmhurst, and it always used to be Leonard and Dorothy Elmhurst until I became there. Uh, Dorothy and Leonard Elmhurst came with their um, progressive ideas about learning, experimentation, and innovation. Indeed, before she came here, Dorothy was one of the key founders of John Dewey of the New School for Social Research in New York City, which today remains one of the premier progressive educational institutions in the United States. Um, when she teamed up with Leonard, she also teamed up through Leonard with Tagore, who had a commitment to learning by head, by hand, and by heart that we are celebrating on today. Um, and together, they embarked on their own innovations in education finding the first progressive um, mixed, meaning men and women, um, boarding schools in, in Britain. It was a school where the motto was learning by doing, where there were no uniforms, no punishments, no Latin, no Greek, um, but real experimentation and real living together as a basis for learning together, not only academically, but spiritually. Um, that commitment to learning manifests itself after the uh, Elmhurst path um, in 1991, uh, when through Satish Kumar's leadership, the trust uh, committed to the establishment of Schumacher College. John Ponton was a chair at that time, but one of the trustees at that time was Michael Young, who many of us know was Lord Young of Dartington who was a progressive social innovator um, of, of his time and who was known by some of his friends as colleagues as always being right, <clears throat> meaning left. Um, I'm happy to say that um, on the occasion of the founding of Schumacher College, Michael expressed his skepticism to Satish about how long people would be interested in studying the college. And he, and he, he gave it five years. I'm pleased to say that Michael was wrong uh, on that occasion and perhaps on others. And we're here celebrating six times that life uh, with Satish today. Um, that commitment 
um, to learning continues today. The collaboration, the creativity, the sustainability, and the holistic learning um, of Schumacher has not only had a massive effect on its students, some of whom we will talk to today, like Tom Bivett Karnak. Uh, we'd hoped that Nigel Topping would be joining us today as the next student, but he had to beg off at the last minute. Tom, he said he had some important stuff to do with police or cops or something. <laughs> Um, but also on the trust itself, the focus on learning has become um, the center of the new mission of the trust. We now regard ourselves as a creative catalyst for a just and sustainable society by promoting learning, in ecology, sustainability, arts, and social justice. And my colleague Pavel will be, Pavel will be um, talking about that in a, in a few minutes. Um, so welcome everyone, uh, welcome to the day, but also put in your diaries next Sunday, because on Sunday week, uh, we are going to be celebrating another aspect of Schumacher's success, and that is the distinguished leadership of Satish Kumar, when we turn a parking lot into paradise. The Central Car Park of Dartington Trust will be turned into the Satish Kumar Garden. And next Sunday morning, and next Sunday morning, Satish will be planting the first tree and sowing the first seeds um, in that garden. So please join us and please uh, enjoy today. Uh, I'm sure you'll learn a lot from our distinguished speakers, but we'll learn a lot from you in conversations as we go through these. So thank you. And let me introduce Pavel, who will be talking about all he's been doing and is with his colleagues as director of learning, as head of the college, and as one of the instigating forces in resurrecting the learning spirit of Dartington Trust. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Greg. Thank you. Thank you, Lou. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with everybody, and it's really an honor and a pleasure to be part of this, really the beginning of the celebration of Schumacher's 30th anniversary with the launch and the publication of, uh, of this wonderful book, beautiful, lovely book, as, as Lou has said. Um, so I just want to say a few words of welcome and introduction uh, and elaborate on some of what, what Greg started to talk about in his welcome. And so just to say, to reiterate a little bit, you know, clearly, and many, most of us know that Dartington Estate has really been a center for the progressive and experimental learning for nearly a century in the context of you know, supporting the community from the perspective of arts, ecology, and social justice. Um, and you know, Schumacher College has its own 30-year history you know, that's really come to embody and place into action many of the themes and you know, concepts that intertwined that century-long history as well. Um, the principles of experience, experimentation, engagement, uh, connection with place and community, and a real mission to impact the ways in which we, we relate to the northern human world and to communities that are, that are around us and the world of which we're all a part. And over the past couple of years, the Dartington Trust has really reinvigorated its mission as a center for progressive learning. And we've really seen a dramatic evolution in our top programs and learning across the piece um, at Schumacher College and at the newly um, restarted Dartington School of Arts. So, We've grown from having two master's programs in 2019 to having five running currently, serving over 100 students. Um, and looking at an evolution, anticipating uh, a, a nearly a dozen programs next year, serving 200 students across uh, Schumacher College and the Dartington Arts School, including Schumacher College's first undergraduate program ever, uh, a BSc in regenerative food and farming. Really exciting development. And our dozens of short courses, you know, that weave together throughout the year really embody the foundational principles of Schumacher College. You know, short, ex accessible, uh, engaging, modular learning experiences that anybody can, can sign up for and take, you know, whether it's for a day or two, or as Lou has described, for a week of doing some really fantastic, albeit sometimes rainy, uh, experiences. You know, with leading experts in the field, you know, where else in the world can you come for a weekend and work with top scholars in areas of economics and design? Uh, movement practice, craft, uh, education, facilitation, learning experience, and more. So we found this year even that 
you know, with our um, longstanding Earth Talk series, as we moved online you know, because of the pandemic, we had thousands more participants than we ever could have imagined. And so, you know, Schumacher and Darting are both reaching out across around the world to places that you know we could not dream we would. Jane Goodall. <laughs> I'll just be a minute, Jane. Sorry. Sorry, it's like there are if I continue then. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, so we've also launched, as I, as I mentioned, the Darting Fun Art School, you know, which runs in parallel and intertwined with, with Schumacher College. Um, and this year we ran the first two master's programs in that college, uh, Poetics of Imagination and Arts in Place. And next year we're looking to run uh, five MA and MFA programs at the Darting Fun Art School. And really all of this is underlying all of this amazing work is a, a vibrant global learning community. Um, many of whom are represented here and many of whom are watching online. You know, a network that includes the students who are here with us, the students that join us online because for whatever reason they can't, they're unable to travel here. Um, the extended learning community and family that includes you know, nearly 20,000 alumni, um, you know, teachers, facilitators, and many, many friends of the college um, who continue to build Schumacher College and Dartington is really a true center for progressive learning. Um, that helps us to face sometimes the overwhelming uh, global challenges that we seem to face on an almost daily basis. So about the book, there's so many wonderful uh, stories, voices, reflections, uh, verbal portraits, um, you know, the many voices that make up transformative learning, you know, reveal a deeply interwoven connection between self, community, ecology, and the beauty of the natural world that surrounds us in so many ways. And throughout the book and throughout the college's history and, and its future as well, you know, the foundation of head, heart, and hands that was at the center of the college in 1991 and throughout its history it is, no, it is, is more essential today than I think it ever has been uh, focused on the, the bringing together head, heart, and hands. And it's a testament to the truly regenerative style of learning and, and approach to learning at Schumacher College, you know, a learning that is rooted in the everyday, entwined with the infinite, and reaching toward the yet to be imagined at every turn. Our learning community embraces adaptation, is nourished by feedback loops, and fosters dynamic emergence of resilience whenever it can. And so looking to the next 30 years, the future of Schumacher College is one that's really tied to the future of learning across the world, around the globe, um, accessible modular modes of learning that help us rebuild community, connect with place, reconnect with ecological systems, create roadmaps for new social, artistic, and economic engagement and approaches to our world's challenges. In short, to be regenerative at every scale. So as we stand here together and sort of begin this journey of celebration and continue this 30 year journey um, to the next 30 years of Schumacher College and beyond, you know, it's really a testament and a, a statement of gratitude to all those who have forged that path, you know, starting with Satish and many others who are here and those who continue to walk that path with us for the future. So thank you, it's an honor to be here. So we are delighted to have um, Dr. Jane Goodall here, who um, been at uh, speaking at the G7 this morning. So we are thrilled to have her here. And Satish, do you want to sit there so you can see her? Um, Jane, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Great. Um, I've got Satish here. He's going to um, say hello and, and have a little. Hello, Jane. I can see the back of your head, Satish. <laughs> First of all, congratulations today, um, receiving your Templeton Prize. Well, thank you very much. It was a big surprise, I must say, but uh, fantastic. Okay. Um, it's so lovely to have you here. Um, uh, you have been a great supporter and a friend of Schumacher College. And so we would like to hear your views and your thoughts about the role Schumacher College has played, but also the state of the world uh, and, and in it, in the context of the state of the world, the state of our planet Earth, 
uh, the work of Chewbacca College. So please say a few words of your thing. All right, I will. Um, I will do my best. And first of all, huge congratulations to Schumacher College for 30 years, I think slightly more than 30 years of um, environmental and ecological education. And something that is so very important in the world today. I just wish I was there in person to celebrate with you. I've been grounded here in Bournemouth on the South Coast uh, where I've been since the beginning of the pandemic. But I remember with such warmth my wonderful visits to Schumacher College in the past. And really for this 30th anniversary, I wish that I was there in person, but we just have to make do with the strange virtual world that so many of us live in now. So I, you know, I congratulate Schumacher College on all that it's done because the efforts that have been made there and the programs and the different people who've been through and the value of the education that is handed out cannot be overestimated. We certainly are in very dark times now. And, you know, we've, we've got this terrible pandemic that's caused so much suffering and loss of life and jobs and economic chaos. And it's so tragic, we brought it on ourselves by our disrespect of nature and animals, creating conditions that make it possible for bacteria and viruses to jump from animals to people. I mean, yes, to people where they may start new diseases such as COVID-19. And that same disrespect for the environment, the natural world has led to climate change and loss of biodiversity two of the greatest threats to our future on the planet. So it's really important that young people, everybody really, learns about the environment. And I think environmental education should be part of the curriculum in all schools and outdoor education, especially for young children, so important. So many young people today are divorced from the natural world and they need to experience it to understand it and love it. And that will make them want to protect it. And that is desperately important for our future. So as I say, this kind of education will equip young people to move out into the adult world, equipped and empowered to cope with the terrible problems that we have created for their future. The theme of your gathering, I understand, is education as if people and planet matter. And that, of course, as you know, Satish, fits right into our Jane Goodall Institute Humanitarian and Environmental Problem uh, Program for Students, which is also celebrating its 30th year this year because it began in 1991 it's now in 67 countries around the world and growing all the time. It's even been growing during the pandemic. We registered in India, we registered in Turkey, we registered, we were about to register, register in Israel when the current disastrous situation erupted. So that's on hold. And then of course, we'll have to make every effort to launch it in Palestine as well. The Roots and Shoots program has a main message, and that is that every single one of us makes an impact every single day. And unless we're living in absolute poverty or in really authoritarian regimes, we can choose what sort of difference we make. And every group is choosing three projects because I learned in the rainforest how everything is interconnected. And so every group chooses three projects to make the world better. One to help people, one to help animals, other animals, and one to help the environment. And the projects that they choose will differ according to the country that they're in, according to their age, their socioeconomic group, their culture, their religion. It's very flexible and it's ground up and we don't dictate what the young people do. 
And so because they're choosing projects they're passionate about uh, and are empowered to take action, they really roll up their sleeves and get out there. And my goodness, they are making a difference. So our aims and those of Schumacher College are very much the same, although different, but in both cases, it's helping people to come to grips with the absolute mess that we've made of this planet. And luckily, it's not only Roots and Shoots, there's many youth programs today that are working to make this a better world for future generations. And these young people from the early, when we began in 91, they're out there in the adult world. And many of them are actually carrying the values that they gained during the program out into their lives. And the main value I would say is respect, respect for each other, respect for animals, respect for the environment. And this is so desperately important because we must, we absolutely must stop thinking this ridiculous thought that we can have unlimited economic development on a planet with finite natural resources and growing human populations and growing populations of our livestock. And so we need to get together. Programs like that at Schumacher College, programs like Roots and Shoots, the programs JGI does in Africa to empower people to alleviate poverty. Because if you're really poor, you, you just have to live you have to seize every opportunity just to stay alive. So you cut down the trees to grow more food, to feed your family or make charcoal. In an urban area, you buy the cheapest food. You can't afford to ask, um, is it cheap because of child slave labor, unequal wages? Did it harm the environment? Was it cruel to animals? So I, I don't have very long to speak and it's very difficult not being there with you and I wish there was a chance to interact a little bit, but I'm told that I just have these few minutes. And so the message is that we have a window of time, <clears throat> although some scientists say that we're on a downward trajectory and we basically had it. No, there's a window of time and it's not very big and it's closing. But if we get together now, those of us who care and take action together, then indeed we have a very good chance of healing some of the harm we've inflicted and at least slowing down climate change and loss of biodiversity. That's so wonderful what you are saying. Um, Jane, our universities and colleges. I can't hear. I can't hear. It's not loud enough. Maybe. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yes, now no. I can hear you. Now I can hear you. Okay. Um, I was just going to ask you that all our universities and colleges and schools, I mean, you talked about Roots and Shoots, your organization. Uh, this educational system was designed to meet the needs of the economic age and the industrial age. And now we are entering into the sort of age of ecology as you have advocated and have pioneered, one of the pioneers you are. Um, how can we change the educational system so that our students in schools and universities learn to uh, live in harmony with nature rather than look at nature as a resource for the economy? What can be done to change the educational system? Well, this is what we're working at. And of course, it depends on which country. Um, like in the UK, we are working with the government education people. So we've got Roots and Shoots as, a, as part of the curriculum in, I think it's 1,800 schools. And in the United States, it differs from state to state. But we, we definitely try and get it into the curriculum, kindergarten, university, everything in between. Because I truly believe environmental education should be part of every single 
um, curriculum in schools, and particularly for young people, for, the, for kindergarten and primary school, as much possible uh, outdoor education so that children can try and reconnect with nature. We, we've, we've harmed society by our disconnect with nature. We're part of the natural world. And we actually depend on it for clean air and fresh water and regulating climate and rainfall and so on. And we, we're forgetting that. And so, as you say, Satish, we are treating it as though it's there for us to do as we wish with, and it's not. I mean, I just feel when I'm out in the rainforest, I feel a really, really strong spiritual connection with the natural world. And it's not there for us. And we should value it for itself. And once we do that and learn about it and the amazing um, complexity, I call it the tapestry of life. And it's so beautiful, so amazing, and so much more intelligent in its design than any single human person. Something recognized by Albert Einstein and many other of the best brains on the planet today. There is intelligence behind the creation of the universe. That's lovely. Thank you very much. It's a great joy and pleasure to have you among us in this uh, 30th anniversary of Schumacher College and, and our book launch. Thank you very much for your time and, and your uh, very inspiring and profound and wise words. We are very grateful to have you, even although virtually on the screen, but thank you very much for your time. Uh, and, and again, congratulations uh, for the award and, and many, many uh, new, more years for your work. The world may be influenced by your thoughts and your ideas. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Satish. And could you for one minute turn around so that I can see your face? Just one minute. Okay. So I only see the back of your head. There he is. Hello, my friend. <laughs> yes, I know you can't see me now, but I couldn't see you the whole time. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. Okay, hey, so it's, um, so when you've been to Schumacher College, um, what happens next? So we're delighted to have one of our dynamic alumni here, um, one who was involved with world leaders at the Paris climate negotiations in 2015. Uh, please welcome Tom Rivet. Um, what have you been doing with your time? <laughs> well, first of all, um, it's amazing to be in a room full of people. This is the closest I've been to this many people for months and months, and it's lovely to see you. And I'm sorry for everyone who's on the remote. And second, I don't know how I won the lottery to be here representing Schumacher students. There are so many thousands of people who've been to Schumacher who have done incredible things. But thank you. It's really lovely to be here with Satish and Carl and you. Um, so I'll just give you a small element of my story. I mean, Schumacher has changed so many people's lives in such a profound way, but I think mine is probably close to the top in terms of the transformation that led to. I arrived at the college in 2006. And at that time I was a recently disrobed Buddhist monk where I'd been for a few years. I'd come back to the UK and I had trained as a chairmaker 
So I arrived with a box of tools at Schumacher College in a beaten up old truck and Satish and Anne and Inga and many other people uh, very generously let me live there. And I stayed at the college and I made chairs. And I wanted to bring together the sort of attention of mindfulness with some other practice. And because of my mid-20s, I didn't even really know what I wanted to do with my life. And the next few years, I had this unbelievable privilege of time and of education and the individuals who came through. So I would go for long walks in the woods with Henry Borton and talk about complexity and emergence and what that meant. I remember when the great oak fell outside Schumacher and I spent two days in the rain with Brian Goodwin talking about complexity and using sort of knives and whittling these bits of wood and just that sort of day-to-day -day experience. I didn't really know kind of what it was for at the time, but it transformed my worldview from the one that I'd grown up with, which had been the one, the organ, right? Like extraction and all of those elements of the world to one that was more regenerative. Now, years later, um, my life took this peculiar turn. People that I'd met at the college ended up offering me a job to go and advise corporations on climate change. Way led on to way, Nigel Topping, who should be here today, but unfortunately can't be here, gave me a job working at CDP. I got to understand the dynamics of corporations. I started working with CEOs and what that means. And eventually, I was offered a job by Christiana Figueres, who was the executive secretary of the UN Climate Convention. And I met her in New York in 2012. And at the time, she was looking for someone who could lead political strategy for the process that would ultimately become the Paris Agreement. And I met her in New York and we spent the whole day, we met in the morning and we walked. At that time, like the Paris Agreement looked very unlikely. The world had been trying for decades to reach these breakthroughs and it had been hard and hard. And we talked and she was like, you know, we're not there yet. We need to find some other way to approach these issues. And at the end of the day, we're from the bottom of Manhattan right to the north of Central Park. And she looked at me and she said, it's clear to me that you have none of the experience necessary for this job, but something tells me you'd be great. Let's do it. So with the extremely reluctant support of my wife, who's here, and I'm going to come back to her in a minute, um, we moved from Brooklyn to Bonn in Germany. And I was given this role to lead political strategy. Now, in those negotiations, those knotty, difficult, resentful, Gordian knots of resentment and anger between those parts of climate change is fundamentally unfair, right? And it's unfair geographically, generationally, economically. And that leads to an enormous amount of resentment in different camps and entrenched positions. And in that context, where everyone is approaching it with a particular mindset, what I discovered was the things I had learned back in the fields and the rooms at Schumacher were a superpower, right? They were about complexity and emergence. They're about listening and humility and about a different way of doing things. And I began to engage in this process and Christiana who's the most remarkable intuitive person as well. And the two of us would travel the world for years like trying to find this middle ground between countries. Of course, in the end, you know, I'm not claiming credit for the fact of what happened, right? I mean, that would be the rooster claiming credit for the dawn. The world woke up <coughs> in a remarkable way. But at that last minute, after we worked and worked and it had been difficult and challenging, when the gavel came down in Paris and we'd done it, I was sitting in the front row with Al Gore and John Kerry and all these other people. But the two people next to me were Nigel Topping and Paul Dickinson, both of whose lives had also been transformed by Schumacher College. And the thing I take from that is that it is possible to see Schumacher as an eddy in the world, right? It's off to the side, it's got great ideas, but how does it integrate into this moment that we're now facing? We are at the beginning, of the most consequential decade in human history. And that sounds like an exaggeration, but it's not. By the end of this decade, we will either have made a transformation and we'll be coming through to a regenerative future, or we will have lost control of the climate and all of the implications that that will lead to for us, for our descendants, and as we felt from Jane. Now that's a lot, right? I feel like most people, it's a little frisson of fear and, and trepidation. But what I learned from Schumacher is actually, we can face this with a degree of courage and determination that we will meet the moment with as much as is required of it and allow the future to unfold. This is an enormous privilege to be alive right now, to have the opportunity to make this transformative difference. I've been really privileged to play a part in that. And I draw that line straight back to the worldview that I learned at Schumacher. I know lots of other people have that same experience, but I am deeply grateful to you, Satish, and to everyone for Schumacher. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. 
And not only, not only Tom learned complexity and Gaia and deep ecology and all the other things at Schumacher College, but he made a chair, a beautiful handmade chair. And as a kind of memory or as a kind gift, he gave that chair to me. So I treasured that chair, I sit in that chair, have my dinner in that chair. So handicraftsness of college was also I, I mean, if you're, I'm, you're very generous. I'm astonished it's still in one piece, but I'm glad you're <laughs> <laughs> So thank you, Tom. And what you have done in the world for climate change, but behind, that's the headline, but behind that work you use of humility and compassion and love, that those are the values which are kind of underneath the under, under, undercurrent of Shumaha College are those values. And, and so it is by head, heart, and hand, the heart qualities that you learn and you have practiced them in your life and in the world for climate change and so on. So we are very proud of you. <laughs> Thank you. So we're going to have a bit of a kind of Graham Norton moment where these are my guests for the afternoon. And um, just gonna have a little bit of a chat with um, these two interesting guys here. Um, I'm gonna start with the founder um, of the college, Satish Kumar. So first of all, I want to ask about your energy and your drive, which at 85 years old does not seem to be waning at all. Um, and I, I kind of know this because I know you, but I just want you to explain what fires you. What fires me? <laughs> um, love of Schumacher College, love of students. My wife June is here. And I always tell, I've been coming to Schumacher College for 30 years. And every time I leave home, I'm full of passion. I'm going to Schumacher College. <laughs> it's like first time I'm doing something. And I get so inspired. Also, I come over that mode. And nature, and the wild nature, is the source of inspiration, and source of passion, and source of energy. Nature is my family. Nature is my, almost you could say, religion a love of nature. And so when I am among the trees and among the flowers and among the tolls and along, among the river, river dart, I'm energized. And I do things without any attachment to anything. I don't possess anything. I don't, nothing belongs to me and everything belongs to me. That's a kind of state. So then I have no burden on my shoulders. I carry no burden. I seek no success. I seek no money. I seek nothing. I just love. So love is the source of my energy. And love of nature, love of people, love of students. And also the Shumaha College is a community. I'm coming not to an institution where just intellectual ideas are flourishing, but people are living, cooking together, gardening together, uh, washing up together, loving each other, sharing with each other. I mean, as Tom's story you heard, so the combination of this high intellectual ideas of complexity and Gaia and deep ecology and uh, climate change and, and, and a quantum physics and all those things we learn. And at the same time, we are a community. That's a source of my energy. So, um, Pavel, I just wondered, do you think it's important for students who attend the college to be brave enough to start the conversation that matters. I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> that was an easy question. Right? Um, absolutely, and, and I'm sort of thinking about you know, what you said about community, um, and to be brave enough to be in community, um, because being in community requires vulnerability that often people are, you know, it's difficult to become vulnerable. And I think through those conversations and through engagement in community, through love, 
Um, we learn to be vulnerable and then we learn to build resilience through that vulnerability. And the way that I look at building resilience, and we talk about that a lot, the building resilient relationships, and it's, you know, it's throughout the book as well, because those come from the ability to shed our skin, to think about where our edges are, and to explore relationships with, with one another. And that's in community, that's in conversation, that's in relationship. And all of that needs to somehow, and I think it does at Schumacher, and you know, Tom's expressed this quite clearly, lead to action. Uh, so through the making of the chair, through the cooking, through the cleaning together, through the living together, we come out and we do action um, that changes the world. And so I think in that conversation, we lead to community, we lead to resilience, vulnerability, and then action. Uh, just if I can add to that, is at Schumacher College, what we have tried to do is to embody the ideas, mm -hmm. not just intellectually understand, but live them. So it's not just what we learn, but with whom we learn and how we learn. Mm -hmm. So those three things together makes a kind of unique experiment. Mm -hmm. and, and Pavel, I'm so uh, grateful and delighted that the, he has taken over the, the headship and the directorship of the college, and he embodies those values as well. So, Shumaha College is in very good hands, in your good hands. Thank you. Um, so, Peach, I just want to talk to you about some of your friends. So, yes. um, you've met and made so many friends over the years um, through the brilliant work that you've been doing. I'm thinking about Vandana Shiva, and I met her with you, it's just incredible and the late and brilliant Polly Higgins. Um, I just wondered what keeps attracting these amazing teachers and minds to the college. Yes. Um, what attracts these, I mean, we started the college with uh, the author of Gaia Hypothesis, James Lovelock. That was our first teacher. And then we had Arnie Ness, Deep Ecology, Wendell Berry, who was a wonderful, Thomas Berry from America, Vandana Shiva uh, from India, uh, Polly uh, Paul, Paul Higgins, all these people are attracted because there's a kind of authenticity in the college. It's the kind of something people, students are sincerely, genuinely, authentically engaged in something which is of our time. As I was asking uh, Jane, that the educational system which we have in the universities, where all these great teachers like Vandana Shiva and and Arne Ness, and, and Arne Ness was a professor in the University of Oslo. But what they find there is that all education is out of date. They are teaching something which was designed for uh, an industrial age, an age of economy, the 18th, 19th century. And now those things are becoming irrelevant. I mean, Greta Thunberg, she doesn't want to learn all these things, how to run an industry and how to dig wells in Saudi Arabia. She wants to learn how to protect the planet Earth. So these, like people like Vandana Shiva and Polly and Arne Ness and Thomas Berry and Wendell Berry are attracted because here's something we are looking for, which is for the future, for our time. The time for human college curriculum and ideas and learning has now come. And the, all the universities of the world have to follow Schumacher College. So these are the pioneers who come and they are attracted to Schumacher College. And when also they find it a very good community, as, as uh, Pavel mentioned. They find living a, in a community and the teaching is not only taking place in the classroom, teaching is uh, taking place in the kitchen. When I was cooking every week and students will learn with me and I will learn from them. So teachers are as much students as students are, uh, um, uh, um, our, our students. And so this kind of community, this kind of authentic, genuine, sincere search for something which is really good for the future, that attracts all our great teachers. And we have been blessed to have such a wonderful line of uh, teachers who have come for very little, uh, we, we offer them very little, little money. And, mm -hmm. and, and, um, and when I was running the college and with my friend Inga here, I'm delighted you are here, Inga. Inga and I worked together in inviting all these people. And the moment we wrote more or less 80%, uh, Inga, will you remember, 80% of uh, our um, invitations was said, yes. People said, yes, we will come. We have heard of Shumahit Malik, we will come. That was a great response. Um, so you were both actually editors on this beautiful book. Um, and I just wondered, in the book, you talk about 
the pedagogy of freedom versus the pedagogy of fear. I think I need you to explain. Yes, yes. <laughs> but I think the, the pedagogy of fear is the pedagogy of modern educational system. And the greatest fear among the students is incalculated. And that fear is fear of failure. Am I going to succeed? Am I going to make it? Am I going to get a job? Am I going to get recognition? And teachers always say, oh, you are not good enough. Your exam is not good enough. Your paper is not good enough. It can be better. So always this fear that I'm not good enough and I may or may not succeed. Somebody has to give me a job. Will I get a job? Somebody will look after me. Will I get, that is the fear we inculcate in our young people in university. So what I, my passion has been at Shumaha College is that when stu students leave at Shumaha College, and some of you may remember me speaking it, I say, now go out of the world, but don't look for a job. Create your own job. You are amazing. You are a Buddha. You are a Gandhi. You are a Matra King. You are a Mother Teresa. You are a Vandana Shiva. You can be anything you want to be. So giving that courage and confidence and as a fearlessness, I can do what I want to do. I have imagination. I don't have to go to Marks and Spencer to buy imagination. <laughs> I have courage. I don't have to go to Gallery Lafayette to buy courage. I can do things. I can cultivate my creativity, my imagination. So that kind of pedagogy of freedom that Schumacher College has been promoting, rather than how am I going to live? How am I going to work? What are you going to give me a job? Will I be successful? Will I get a book published? What will happen? Forget that. You can be a great champion of it. I mean, I was not educated formally. I didn't go to school or university, but I learned from life. We are all the time learning. So fear is the greatest enemy of our education. And our educational system dampens and, and tramples on the imaginative quality and the creative quality of young people. And young people come out of wounded out of universities quite often. And, and they are just getting into the system, but they, they, they feel, am I going to be successful? So at Shubhaya College, we want to cultivate this idea that you are capable, you can go in the world and you can live a good life, look after nature, look after yourself, no ego, no seeking success, seek fulfillment. That's the pedagogy of freedom. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I was just thinking, I was going to go to Kavao, because she's obviously head of the college, and I was just thinking about going forward, moving forward. Like we're living through a pandemic, and I just wondered what answers have Shuma, has Shuma College got for the world? Well, it's much harder than your last question. <laughs> um, so I, I think that actually Satish has answered a lot of that in, in terms of the building relationships and, and what, what we hope that our graduates will do once they leave. Um, but you know, I think that the pandemic has put us in an interesting place. I, I, don't, I don't foresee any sort of dramatic end to the situation that we're living in, um, but potentially a gradual em emergence at some point. But I think we've learned a lot of lessons here and higher education around the world has learned a lot of lessons. I think Schumacher absolutely has in terms of how we can potentially re-engage in relationships, re-engage with communities from around the world that we haven't had the opportunity to do um, because we've been pushed into these, you know, as, as Jane described, you know, sort of awkward, um, you know, online relationships, but those have also made the world a whole lot smaller. Uh, and so they've enabled us to have conversations, to build partnerships, to really think about our alumni network, our network of partners from around the world, you know, as a, a next step, um, as sort of the future of Schumacher College, to really continue to build um, you know, on those relationships. I, I like to joke often with, you know, students who are looking at Schumacher and saying, well, what do you do afterwards? And I said, well, seems like half of our graduates start a Schumacher College wherever they go. Um, <laughs> and I think that's exactly what they should be doing, whether it's Schumacher Sprouts in, in Belgium or whether it's Escola Schumacher in Brazil or Efecto Mariposa in Colombia or in Japan or China or Australia or other places, that's exactly what people should be doing. Um, but then to connect back to, you know, through a network, to support the students that are here, to support those conversations and to support that action and build community across distance. 
Can I add um, um, do, uh, to this? That in the book, we have kind of three sections. One is what was taught. So we have people like Kutub Kapra, David Orr, Vandana Shiva, all the people who have come to teach what they taught, Rupert Sheldrake, and so on. You will see. Um, then we have a second section in which we have invited our um, uh, uh, alumni, alumni who have gone back and created something. So what is their um, uh, creation? What, is, what have they, they done? What have they um, uh, accomplished? So there's a kind of section in the book which uh, alum, many alumni talk about their work. And so that's a kind of very important uh, section. And the third one is just a uh, uh, future. What is the future uh, of, uh, and particularly Pavel's wonderful chapter in it? So I would urge you all, and we need your support after this event. We, I, we, Pavel and I will be signing, the, Pavel and I could edit it and we could get publisher to publish it. But now for the success of the book and spreading the word, we need your help to promote among your friends and buy a copy of the book and, and, and ask your friends to buy and give a gift of the book. And so please help to promote the book. Thank you. Now we have a rather special guest. <laughs> so Matt Harvey's here and he's, um, he's just compiling some, um, you know, he's joining. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's, a, it's a real honour to be here. I've, I've got a kind of double honour. I'm here and I'm in the book, which is which is amazing. So I can't not read the poem that I've got in the book to you. That's better, yeah, so I can see you better. I was really worried you were going to fall off the back earlier. I was ready to throw myself and save you. You didn't know it, but you were safe. You know you're in danger. Okay. Um, my my poem is on page one nine three. In there. <laughs> just 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 saying. It's in between Gaia's Kitchen, a rich mix with Julia Ponsonby, and uh, regenerative horticulture. Learning by doing. In the uh, what's it? It's in the in the education of hands section. But there are other things in the in the book. Obviously, well worth reading. This is this is my book. And it touches, it touches briefly upon the reductive education system that I was exposed to as a youth, and then it gets slightly better, and then we just move on. So it's called Nature is Here. Nature is there, and we are over here. Please note phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. What could be more clear? Fruit of the good tree of taxonomy fell freely in the garden of my youth, absorbed in bone and blood and intravenous, unspoken, unchallenged, accepted truth of my class, order, family, and genus. But wilder seeds blew in on some rogue breeze, found refuge and took root. Few but enough produced a crop of quiet epiphanies. It's us. Nature is us. We are such stuff as soil is made of. Deep inside the grower stirs nature's urge to quicken, germinate the, so the seeds both within and without the sower. But how can such truth thrive and propagate? In Southwest Devon, there is a raised bed where this is known, believed in, watered, fed. There you go, there you go. thank you. Um, Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, I mean, there, it's, there are better things in the book, let's be honest, but that was my bit. That was my bit that I'm entitled to read to you. Now, I want to do, that was a world premiere, by the way, and um, I want to do another world premiere. This, this, is, this, this next poem, is a, is a, it was a commission, and it's part of a longer sequence uh, by different people called the One World Song Cycle, and the piece before it speaks of a time where humankind is in harmony with nature. It speaks of the fragility of the balance of this balance and the importance of our custodianship. And they said, now Matt, what we want you to do is to then cover what went wrong. And they, want, they, want to be, they said, we'd like you to cover the time between this sort of prehistoric post-Edenic societies right up to the present time. 
and make it no longer than two minutes, okay? So, that, so these are the, uh, yeah, the parameters for this poem, what went wrong. <clears throat> and life was good and the earth was large and our brains grew big and we said, we're in charge. And the sun said, take it easy. And the earth said, chill. And the sea said, dream deeply. And the wind said, roam where you will. The earth was huge. It seemed to go on forever. And we discovered we had opposable thumbs and were very, very clever. We invented things, beakers, agriculture, the wheel, indoor murals, fur coats, fences. We went through some interesting ages, stone, bronze, iron. Then the earth, while the earth turned, the sun burned and the wind, for some reason, kept sighing. And one day, a man said, behold, here is a line. What's on this side of the line is mine. And what's on the other side, that's mine too. And so is she, and so are you. And we invented war and reasons for war and hierarchical power structures. And the earth groaned and the sun paled and the sea sighed and the wind exhaled. And we invented money. And money began to speak. He said, you know your problem? You don't have enough of me. And everybody had to agree because that's how it felt. And money said, you dig? And we dug. And we discovered fossil fuels. Oh, compact and combustible, accessible, industrial. And the wind said, whoa. And the sea said, no. And the sun just shone. And the earth said, surprisingly gently, steady on, but no one heard because the drilling was so thrilling, it was fun, it was fulfilling, and the mining and refining were delightful and divine and particularly fun and fascinatingly fantastic. Uh, a byproduct of petroleum was plastic. Uh, cheap, flexible, and versatile, disposable, yet durable, and the earth said it's so wasteful, and the sea said it's disgraceful, and hierarchical power structures said, shh, 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 I think money wants to say something. And money said, this is amazing. It was the age of human zooming, fire and fuming, aviation, mass industrialization, clamor, glamour, noise and poison, louder, faster, deeper, hotter, deeper, hotter, louder, faster. And the earth shuddered and the wind raged and the sun burned hot and the sea was raised. And money said, dig, drill, spray, burn. It's too late to turn, it's too late to turn. It said, dig, drill, spray, burn. And the earth, with infinite patience, said, you have extraordinary talents, but things are getting out of whack. Things are getting out of balance. It's time to step back. And money said, more, 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 more speed, more spin, more wheels, more deals, more stuff. And the earth said, enough. Oh. Thank you. I haven't actually been timing myself, and I think I've got time for one more. This is, this is, and what I want to do is, this is no place to come and squash your dog. <laughs> um, I've, been, I've been lucky enough to be invited along many, many times over the years to actually you know, share evenings at, at Schumacher College and, and read, read poems and things like that. Um, and this is one of the ones I love I loved to read there. It's, it's much more kind of down to earth. And it's, it's actually about slugs. It's inspired by my relationship with slugs. Which is, it's, it's been a difficult relationship. And people say, people say to me, slugs are your friends, Matt. And I think, well, I don't need that kind of friend, you know? And I'm often, I, I come here and I, I ask people about how to deal with slugs. And people have got you know, these kind of benign suggestions of beer. All sorts of things. If you put a beer trap down, they think it's a festival. That's not how it works. Acupuncture is good, but mainly if they're on your body, acupuncture is great. Anyway, poetry works right up close in their faces, read them poetry. They don't like it. So this it's a celebratory poem, but it's all you know, if you are if you are very pro slug, you might want to look away because yeah. slug. Low-born land mollusk, high-impact intruder, easy oozer, slime exuder, freeloader, sprout spoiler, meandering marauder, disrespecter of my broad beans border. 
with a one-track mind and a one-track body. Diligent pillager, soft-horned in Visigoth. Slow silver scribbler, paradoxically busy slow. Tithe taker, hole maker, indiscriminate direct debitor. Bold as brass, brassica editor. You're a squishy spoil sport, a glistening drag, the licorice all sort nobody wants to find in the bag. It's time that you were brought to book. You're not as tasty as you look. Listen, chum, you are disposable. Look at my thumb, it is opposable. Unwelcome invertebrate, this might just hurt a bit. I pluck you and I chuck you into distant, dew-drenched greenery. Isn't that mean of me? Slug, when all is said and done, you can hide, but you can't run. <laughs> a down-to-earth note to end on. Thank you. Okay, so it, you thought it couldn't get any more exciting? Well, it is because we've got a lovely message from Tim Smith, who has sent it through today, and this is how we're going to close today. So thank you so much for coming, everybody. You are all welcome. And we just had such a lovely afternoon with everybody here, and there's drinks, and there's book signing afterwards. But we're going to have a few words. He's not live. He's recorded, so don't worry. Um, but yes, here's Tim Smith. Hello, dear Satish and Pavel. Um, I really wish I could be with you for the launch of this edited work of 30 years of the Schumacher College. Isn't it strange, a bit like in 1969, we were all stardust and it seemed like it was hippie and alternative. And yet today we find ourselves with this interface between science uh, and that alternative view of all those years ago. And we find that actually many of those intuitions are being found to be correct, whether it be the microbiome of the human body or the mycorrhiza of the wood wide web beneath our feet, showing that we are all creatures. Uh, we are all earthlings, which is a very spiritual moment. What a time to be alive, actually, when in a largely secular age, we find ourselves being confronted with the most extraordinary reality, um, which is that as we concentrate on living within the weft and weave of the natural world, uh, that all along we are part of this miraculous system. Schumacher have been a really fundamental part within the culture of Britain and it's actually been re really understated that the surfacing of the philosophical propositions, the spiritual propositions around living well within the boundaries of our planet home uh, have long been championed with you and, and more importantly within a philosophical context of um, if you like those movements which are artisanal, which show the nobility, if you like, of the pursuit of understanding the nature of things, I guess we would all have a fellow feeling with things like uh, um, at the arts and crafts movement and of course the very real connection between uh, Dartington and Schumacher and Bauhaus. It is a most appropriate time for you to be celebrating these 30 years in this marvellous book because your time is strangely now. Never has it been more needed than right now. Never has there been a moment, actually, I think, in British cultural history where we're drawing together, if you like, systems theory, neural networks, a philosophical proposition based on a spiritual understanding of us being earthlings, all wrapped up into something which reflects a very human need for belonging, rootedness, and a fellow spiritedness. How extraordinary that this pandemic has offered us up an opportunity where probably the equivalent of 50 years worth of education has come in the space of eight months to realize that nature is no respecter of natural boundaries, uh, national boundaries rather, and that nature is no respecter at all of any sense of a human dominance of all that. How appropriate then that our lockdowns should have been perhaps a liberation from those narrow confines of thought uh, and the very things you have been championing since you were knee-high to a grasshopper are coming to a form of fulfillment and I don't think you'd ever believe this just imagine that you are going to be right at the heart of establishment thinking what a thing to think about look I wish you a splendid evening uh, 
a splendid celebration for an important book. I wish I was with you. And so I'm sending you a giant hug from the wild, wild west and wishing you every good luck with this wonderful, wonderful compositional gift to all of us.